My name is Charlotte Hobbs, and I lead the research and clinical management at Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. It is my distinct pleasure on behalf of Global Genes to welcome you to this keynote session on the cusp of cures. But just before I introduce Dr. Ernoff, here at Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, we work with Rady Children's Hospital and, to, and other hospitals around the nation to really help children with rare diseases and their parents identify their diagnosis. It's a, a been a real pleasure and a, an incredible privilege for me over the last two and a half decades to work as the neonatal hospitalist with parents who are expecting a new baby and about to deliver a new baby. And as you may all know, when that happens, it's such a joyful event. However, in some cases, if a baby is born with a rare disease, whether it be a structural defect or not, sometimes the atmosphere in the delivery room changes pretty quickly. And um, then we have to really pay attention and provide the best care that we can for a baby who may be very critically ill. In the last five uh, years, it's been, we've been able to then provide rapid whole genome sequencing to these babies. And that has just been a game changer. As uh, Francis Collins said in 2003, when we completed the human genome project, it would cha change a paradigm in medicine, and it certainly has. Today, Dr. Ernoff is going to talk about not just diagnosis, but treatment. And so I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you Dr. Fider Ernoff, he, who is the Scientific Director of Technology and Translation at the Innovative Genomics Institute. And Dr. Ernoff is also a professor of genetics, genomics, and development in the Molecular and Cell Biology Department at the University of California, Berkeley. He has devoted his career and is spending time now to accelerate the path of CRISPR-based therapies for rare genetic diseases. He's moving from the lab to the clinic to develop these new technologies, and we will all benefit from those. He has uh, published more than 80 publications and has 68 patents that have been issued. So without further ado, I'm just really delighted and look forward to Dr. Ernoff's presentation today. Dr. Ernoff? Dr. Hobbs, thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's very moving to me to be introduced by a, a physician uh, who works on the, the challenge of you know, delivering the good news to the parents. And then if the news isn't good on doing everything one can to, to have the news become good after all. And the one key takeaway I'm hopeful to deliver to the, the audience is uh, the field I worked in, which is targeted genetic engineering, has made progress of a type where we can seriously speak about CRISPR cures on demand. And uh, the, in order to make that happen, we will have to uh, create fundamentally new alignments of forces across the healthcare and uh, biomedical R&D sector. And I'm absolutely convinced that the 2020s will be the decade where that can actually happen. And I think innovative partnerships, such as the one that could be fostered through an interaction and the meeting of this type, are precisely what should be happening. So thank you very much for the invitation. And also, of course, I'm honored to represent my university and my institute. And an essential slide disclosing my conflicts of interest. I am the scientific co-founder and paid consultant and hold equity in tune therapeutics. And I'm a paid advisor to GSK. Uh, the Innovative Genomics Institute uh, was founded by Jennifer Doudna, who was awarded the Nobel Prize together with Emmanuel Charpentier for the development of CRISPR gene editing. There she is in her backyard receiving the medal. The Swedes came to her uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, it's remarkable that that same year, the world learned that there are CRISPR edited people who are clinically well. And I will speak about both of them. Victoria Gray on the left is a subject on the clinical trial by CRISPR Therapeutics for sickle cell disease and Patrick Doherty on the right is a subject on the clinical trial in the UK, I believe actually, uh, focused on uh, his TTR amyloidosis. I'll, speak, I'll describe more, much more about this in just a sec, but I just wanna start by saying that here's Jennifer with her Nobel prize for CRISPR editing and here are CRISPR edited people the same year. So, uh, you know, five years ago, maybe even three years ago, I would have had to spend 20 minutes explaining CRISPR. Uh, that's no longer the case. It's, it's really remarkable and evidence to how broadly CRISPR is understood and appreciated that th this introduction can be contracted to about two minutes. 
The genome is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the ninth. That's really long. What you're seeing here is just 0.3% of it. So the familiar image on the right uh, is only 12 base pairs. Uh, unfortunately, the human genome is highly resistant to targeted change, which is precisely what one would want if you were developing a genomic therapy for a genetic disease. So uh, the solution emerged after 30 years of basic and applied research through the realization that of the many pathways of DNA repair and our DNA gets damaged all the time, the, probably the most genotoxic lesion is a double strand break. And for that reason, mother nature has evolved multiple pathways to repair these double strand breaks. Uh, up to 50 of them occur per cell cycle. And there are multiple pathways that are conserved across evolution, which fast forward is why gene editing works in everything from yeast to rice to cows to humans, as I'm about to show. So these two pathways are uh, putting the two ends back together or using a, an identical or similar repair template to unidirectionally transfer genetic information. I really encourage you to read Matt Porteous's wonderful review in the New England Journal in 2019, uh, because he really does, I think, a spectacular job taking these repair pathways and showcasing to you the many ways in which a double strand break induced by a programmable nucleus such as Cas9 can be leveraged in the clinic to address conditions as diverse as cancer, HIV, the hemoglobinopathies, uh, um, uh, uh, cancer, and uh, hemophilia B. All of that's in clinical trials right now. And it's just striking that the single double strand break can be used for so many reasons. And I think Matt, Matt reviews is great. I think it's essential that we all remind ourselves to what extent uh, Jennifer and Emmanuel's work was not driven by the desire to build gene editing, but was driven by basic curiosity. So it's really a poster child for the enormous real world impact of basic research. CRISPR-Cas is a bacterial adaptive immune response system. And uh, the genius of uh, Jennifer's and Emmanuel's discovery and proposal, which they reduced uh, to practice, of course, and other, as other labs had, is the realization that you can repurpose CRISPR-Cas to go from uh, bacterial cells to human cells. So a uh, really quick animation, simply for those of you who haven't actually seen how Cas9 can be programmed to drive genome editing. This is sort of the introduction to Microsoft Word of genome editing. Uh, so if you wanna cut a region of interest to edit it, you take this magnificent enzyme and you weaponize it with a short snippet of RNA to recognize the target DNA of interest. And then uh, in schematic form, you're gonna show this and see this in high resolution in a second, it actually searches the human nucleus uh, for the match and uh, initiates the editing event. So in practical terms, if the base pair in red is the one you wish to change and uh, you need a short dinucleotide motif next to that base pair for biochemical reasons that Jennifer discovered that I am happy to explain in Q&A, uh, you need to find a 20 base match to an RNA that Cas will carry. And that's the programmable part. And the pr programmability emerges out of rules of base pairing that all of us learned in middle school. So it's that's the, the medicinal chemistry of designing a CRISPR-Cas is fundamentally different than from designing a small molecule or engineering a biologic. Uh, once you weaponize Cas with this match, it runs around the nucleus, finds the target, forms this beautiful uh, heteroduplex, and then creates a double strand break, which is the initiating event of genome editing. And uh, you will say to me, well, this is really simple. I know it's really simple. Now, Clinical editing is a lot more sophisticated than this, but the, the notion that you can design a medicine using principles that I can explain to my five and a half year old is kind of mind blowing. And yet here we are. So um, I am here taking the double strand break repair pathways you saw earlier to simply showcase the fact that um, there are clinical trials right now based on that double strand break. And for gene knockout, I'll speak to how that's being put to use in the hemoglobinopathies, amyloidosis, congenital blindness. I will briefly mention HIV and cancer. And on this side, also for the hemoglobinopathies, blood clotting disease, and lysosomal storage disorders. And what are you to take away from this? Look at how broad the disease classes are, how broad the spectrum of indications. This really showcases the potential of uh, editing. It can be le truly leveraged across so many different disease classes. So I'm gonna say something really uh, audacious and uh, I'm going to then show you data that support the claim. So the age of CRISPR has really redefined the meaning of the term druggable target. You know, our classic vision of druggability, it has to be an enzyme such as a kinase or maybe a GPCR. Well, uh, so the age of CRISPR has redefined that. If it's in the genome, it's a druggable target. And lest you think that this is, you know, I just made this up for purposes of a presentation. No, let me show you clinical evidence for that. 
not just R&D evidence, clinical evidence. And it comes in fact out of work on uh, treating the hemoglobinopathies and that brave human being, Victoria Gray, consented to being a subject. And I'm going to tell you how uh, the world came about to develop a medicine that so far has been used to, to the best of our knowledge, treat 14 people with sickle and something like 25 people with transfusion dependent thalassemia with very impressive clinical outcomes so far. Uh, sickle, point mutation, classic genetic disease. We've known about its genetic basis for since I think the 1920s or, and then we've known about the molecular basis since the 1950s. Um, and yet, how are we doing with respect to cures? Well, in fact, as you're about to see, we're doing remarkably well. Um, and here are, uh, if you're interested in the details, um, this review came out this year in CRISPR journal. Um, the takeaway from this very busy slide is the extent to which a single disease with a single cause, which is this point mutation, um, uh, has been approached using <clears throat> multiple editing strategies, uh, using multiple groups in academia and in uh, industry. I had the good fortune of developing this approach and working on this approach. And I'm going to walk you through this just to highlight the extent to which we really can drug the human genome in, in a remarkable diversity of ways. And in particular, I will highlight clinical progress made by CRISPR therapeutics for this particular approach, which is elevation of fetal globin. So um, the, the, this approach emerged out of the a clinical observation that sickle is uh, a variably expressive. Many of you treat uh, folks with sickle and you know that some of them are quite, quite unwell and some of them are relatively well. And um, this variable expressivity um, is really what led us to a, an approach that ultimately helped Victoria Gray shown here Rob Stein at NPR has done some magnificent reporting, narrating her patient journey, which I think is just magnificent. Um, uh, Stu Orkin and Dan Bauer uh, really deserve an enormous amount of credit for sort of pushing several of the key early domino tiles and then enabling many of the downstream ones. Um, uh, I love this representation from Stu and Dan's review because it highlights how this all started from a genome-wide association study looking for genetic clues that uh, would lead us to an approach to treating sickle and thal that is not repair of the mutation, but actually doing something else. And then uh, going all the way to discovering an Achilles heel in a regulatory element that ultimately uh, what became the lead clinical strategy that's being used to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, improve the lives of some 30 plus subjects I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm actually going to uh, change now and represent the exact same principle using a slightly different uh, view for the following reason. A persistent theme in what I'm going to speak with you about today is the extent to which all other technologies across the technology, across the problem space of building a genomic therapy have really risen up. So it's not just CRISPR getting better. There's all these other analyses and Dr. Hobbs spoke about rapid NGS. There's so many other things in addition that are really enabling the, an accelerated path forward. So specifically with respect to getting to an approach to edit um, for sickle and thal, we start with a genome-wide association study and discover a hit genetic variation at which modifies disease severity in both sickle and thal. And then we do epigenome mapping to discover that this tracks to a regulatory element of a gene called BCL11A. And then we do multiple modes of editing and functional genomics analysis to discover a five base pair motif, the targeted editing of which elevates levels of fetal globin, and all of you know what that is. It's a, it's a globin, it's a beta-like globin, which is encoded in our genome, but is silent in adults, including folks with sickle cell disease. Unfortunately, well, there's, it's a, it's a, the, the, the full story is quite nuanced, but the bottom line is, you know, inactivation of fetal globin post-birth uh, is normal in, in healthy individuals, but in folks with sickle and thal, that creates the problem that mother nature now activates a mutant globin instead of using the perfectly normal fetal one. So this is the strategy that was used to discover a way to gene edit something that ultimately would elevate fetal globin in folks with sickle and thal. And I'm now going to turn to some clinical trial data. This actually went all the way to human from the discovery uh, at Sangamo Therapeutics uh, of the target in 2013. Uh, this actually went to clinic and uh, Sangamo and CRISPR both took it to clinic. Uh, uh, CRISPR has described a lot more data and the magnificent paper from the New England Journal really does a spectacular job explaining um, how this all came about. Um, I just want to quickly mention that the logistics of manufacturing this genomic therapy are formidable. You harvest hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, you electroporate them in a GMP room with CRISPR-Cas that goes into the cells, 
it uh, knocks out this regulatory element of BCL11A, which ultimately will lead to elevation of fetal globin. And then the cells are cryopreserved before infusion, and the subject also has to be treated with chemotherapy. And the clinicians in the audience will appreciate the number 13 mix per kg busulfan. So subjects become neutropenic and thrombocytopenic, and you can, again, the transplanters in the room know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, how is it going? It's going spectacularly well. Uh, Victoria Gray, uh, 24 months post-dosing, has 80% edited chromosomes in her bone marrow, which is kind of astonishing. And uh, she has like 45% fetal hemoglobin. And uh, she uh, has been free of uh, transfusion requirements and of uh, pain crises ever since. Uh, now, uh, this, this is data that are, uh, as of March 15, CRISPR and Vertex have subsequently disclosed more data. The bottom line is, uh, here you see data on seven subjects that appear to be free of vasoclusive crises after dosing. I think the numbers are as of two days ago that I checked, 22 subjects with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia, and I think uh, nine subjects overall on the CRISPR trial for sickle appear to be free of transfusions and in the case of sickle, free of vasoclusive crisis after being CRISPR. So uh, this really stands on the shoulders, of course, of 33 years of development of gene therapy. And this is a slide shared by Philip Gregory, um, grateful from Bluebird Bio, and they, of course, as many of you know, have filed a BLA in the United States to uh, uh, have physicians prescribe a medicine, a, a gene therapy medicine for um, uh, beta thalassemia. And the manufacturing process is quite similar, with the difference being, of course, that you don't do gene editing at a specific position, but you do quasi-random uh, integration of a, of a restorative transgene. And uh, Bluebird is much further ahead than any of the CRISPR companies or the other editing companies. Again, thanks to Philip for sharing this amazing, really amazing clinical trial data slide. Um, this is on sickle. I think this is something like 17 or 18 subjects. And you can see that, uh, you know, at various du durations uh, post-dosing, these subjects are transfusion-free and they're free of vasoclusive crises. So here we are, folks, 2021. We have multiple subjects on phase one, two trials of CRISPR who are free of vasoclusive crisis and transfusions and a larger cohort of subjects free of the same using gene therapy. So hooray, I guess. Well, so, and now here comes the cold light of reality. You know, we talk about health justice. So, um, you know, it's no surprise that these genomic therapies are expensive. Uh, the CAR-T genomic therapies are 400, 500,000 per subject. A genomic therapy for congenital blindness is 850,000. A genomic therapy, gene therapy for SMA is, I believe, 2.1 million. And in precise accordance with that notion, Bluebird uh, was going to price uh, this medicine for sickle at 1.8 million. Uh, um, and then it was really a, a stunning phenomenon, to be honest with you. I don't know how else to say, use what the word to use except use the word stunning. When Bluebird announced that they uh, are leaving the European market uh, because European pairs are uh, uncomfortable with that kind of pricing. You know, so the, the 64,000 base pair question for all of us is, I'm sorry, so where, where does that leave the community? Like, what are we going to do? So listen, I mean, the brass tax, honest truth is the current industry pricing scheme is not scalable. So one solution is to, inspired by the Sabin vaccine precedent, to develop and deploy certain editing-based medicines in the nonprofit public sector. I want to emphasize this is not just, you know, utopia. So the Innovative Genomics Institute, uh, uh, founded by Jennifer, with the notion of a responsibility to pursue CRISPR's enormous potential to achieve previously impossible to solutions that would be available to anyone. And we are a CRISPR-focused institute. And we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Uh, basic work and then translational work uh, led by Jacob Cord in partnership with Mark Walters at UCSF and Don Cohn at UCLA led us to the first uh, open clinic, open IND, for a CRISPR therapy in sickle cell disease that is supported by uh, the CERN, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. We're honored for that support. Uh, it involves uh, an approach similar to what is being done, except that we do a repair of the mutation. And, um, you know, one of the other areas of enormous focus for us is, um, as many of you know, uh, 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 Bluebird has had a scare. They had uh, AML. Uh, uh, and it really traces to an increased risk of AML uh, in the sickle individual. So in other words, this is not due to the gene therapy vector. And so, you know, we have this remarkable situation where we have genomic therapies that could work, 
but folks with sickle say things like, and this is the voice of the human being with sickle, who say, would I take a genomic therapy? No. But then one person with sickle said in a public forum, I don't want to risk dying while curing it. So grateful to Lee Witkowski at the IGI for you know, enunciating a vision where we would iterate on Gen 1, then Gen 2, then Gen 3 medicines that would be safer, more efficient, more um, sort of community informed in their development. And so what will that involve? Uh, using non-viral gene editing, processing the cells uh, in closed loop system, then, then transitioning to ex vivo, and then ultimately thinking about the public sector. So all the relevant technologies will eventually get there. So I just wanna flag work by Ross Wilson's lab and Jennifer Doudna's lab here at the AGI that involves self-delivering or virus-like particle delivering of Cas9, where ultimately we'll get to minimal to no mobilization and minimal to no conditioning. Um, I'm checking the time and realizing that I am a bit, Dr. Hobbs, what's my, what's my time like? I, I wanna tune my, tune my presentation window to how much time I have. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, AD is telling me I, I will meet that timeline. So what does this, what is this going to take? So a couple of things. I think it's essential we uh, think forward to having these therapies be safer. And so we have a CAP accredited CLIA lab directed by Petros Janikopoulos, uh, who is a physician specializing in molecular pathology. And we are developing CLIA grade assays to support the clinical, current clinical trial. And to be clear, those currently don't exist. There is no genomic therapy trial right now, to the best of my knowledge, that's supported by a clear grade assay with the gold standard. But Petros's real vision and what we're actually actively doing is weaponizing our CLIA and CAP accredited lab to build companion diagnostics for CRISPR therapies for rare disease specifically configured to make them safer. So let me run through CRISPR as an in vivo medicine. I'll go through this very quickly because I really want to spend five or six minutes focusing on um, the challenge of the N of one. So, this is published, so bear with me. I'm just going to flag for you if you're interested. And many of you, of course, are. This is what to read. Intelia described uh, in the New England Journal paper their work on non-viral delivery of a lipid nanoparticle formulated messenger RNA encoding Cas9 and the guide RNA. It's administered systemically. It homes to the liver where Cas9 goes into the nucleus and creates a double strand break to disrupt a gene, ATTR, toxic aggregates of which cause TTR amyloidosis and read the paper and you will see two remarkable facts. The speed with which you have a drop in the serum relevant biomarker, the high dose cohort, 96% drop in the serum biomarker of the gene being edited within 28 days. And critically, non-human primate data show that the editor itself is gone. It goes into the nucleus, it knocks it out, and then the Cas9 itself is gone. And there's a dose responsive effect, which is magnificent. Congrats to Intelli. Editus Medicine tomorrow, oh my goodness, will describe results from their phase one, two. Uh, and uh, this is AAV administration to the eye to restore a normal gene function. If you're interested before the press release tomorrow, read Morgan Mader's wonderful paper led by Haiyan Zhang and Vic Meyer and Charlie Albright at Editus. So this is the non-human primary data, the clinical trial data are tomorrow. Completely different disease, different delivery mode, AAV into the eye, to knock out a toxic splice site to restore vision. Look at the data tomorrow. And then a remarkable new development where excision got authorization to open a clinical trial for in vivo administered CAS to cut out the HIV provirus. This is for a disease in which there have been for a decade, multiple approved small molecules that are safe and effective and controlling the level of the virus. So the FDA is increasingly getting comfortable with in vivo editing. Um, a key development has been the uh, clinical deployment of an approach where the liver is used as a protein secretion factory for proteins that are normally used as enzyme replacement therapy for blood clotting or the lysosomal storage disease. And I think this could be a platform broadly leverageable into N of 1, which can be otherwise treated by repeat administration of ERT. So please look at Kathy High's paper with Sangamo Therapeutics, which established the proof of concept and both Sangamo and Intelia Regeneron are pursuing this approach, Sangamo with zinc fingers, they were first, and then uh, Intelia essentially did the exact same thing, but with Cas9. So it's really remarkable that two biotech companies in partnership are pursuing this safe harbor approach where you knock something into the liver and the liver then secretes the protein. The difference from what I showed you earlier with editing for the hemoglobinopathies and editing for TTR is this is not a gene knockout, this is a targeted insertion. 
So delivery is very rapidly being elaborated. Um, uh, read this wonderful review from Niren and Dave, my two colleagues here at UC Berkeley. Uh, the central takeaway from this review is other than the kidney, which is super, super hard, uh, I fully anticipate the vast majority of organ systems in the human body to be tractable to delivery of CRISPR-Cas and vivo in the next decade. I really do. The kidney, we all want to work. It will work as well. I just, I'm not as all out optimistic. It will work. I just don't know where. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through this because I really want to focus on for the next three or four minutes, the challenge of developing CRISPR cures for all, which of course is the purpose of this gathering. This is Carly Koch. She's crying. Uh, uh, I cry too when I speak with her so about her. So I'm just going to talk right through so as not to choke up. Uh, she was described in the New York Times. She, I believe, passed away to, to a rare immune deficiency. She was sitting with her mom discussing who's going to get her toys after she dies. Um, and uh, this is devastating to me personally and everybody else, because in 2005, we described how to correct these point mutations. And there's a charted preclinical path to repair the kinds of point mutations. And here's this young woman telling her mom who gets her toys and what music to play at her funeral. How can this be? Why didn't somebody edit Carly? So the reason is this. Bear with me for 60 seconds of technicality. She had a mutation in this gene, DOC8. Here are the various mutations that cause it. And I'm telling you right now that if you switch from mutation number one to mutation number two, you have to start all the way at the beginning in terms of developing an investigational new drug application. You change the CRISPR itself, it's in UIND. And so that skyrockets the cost. It's completely unscalable. And now, now DOC8 is one of 416 rare disorders of immunity. So, you know, if you think about Amanda Gorman's magnificent vision of, you know, merge mercy with might and might with right, I love the way she said this. You know, we have to be faced with the cold truth. The fact that editing represents an approach to the majority of monogenic disease in principle does not mean that some biotech will take on disease number 823 to save Carly Coke. And there are 5,000 of these. We need a new N of one criminal. We just do. There's no way around this. So you all know about Timothy Yu's work. He's a hero to all of us. It's all published, described in the New York Times. Uh, he basically did it. He developed uh, an N of one antisense, and we're incredibly inspired by the work he did by N. Lorem and Stan Crook. I know many of you know this, so I'm just going to skip through this to simply say, we want to do this for CRISPR. And so highlight, um, Alex Marson and Jennifer Doudna partnered to develop a non-viral editing in T-cells. And uh, there's a child uh, in Cameron Harrell's practice. She has severe autoimmunity and um, she is the basis of our framework for building facile, scalable, walk-in, walk-out, CRISPR-based approaches to repair a point mutation that, as best as we can tell, affects five people on planet Earth. So please watch this space. But I just want to spend the next two minutes talking about the framework. So I just mentioned one disorder, rare autoimmune disorder, five mutations. How do we scale this to Carly Coke and 416 other diseases? Here's what you do. So CRISPR addressed the problem of engaging with the target, but there's everything else, right? So the Center for Translational Genomics at the AGI, which is philanthropically funded, focuses on addressing, on building sort of a vertically integrated approach where for every step from a factor such as CAS to delivery, we have viral and non-viral solutions for key cell types where we have FDA grade efficacy and safety assays, where we then build in a nonprofit academic setting in close partnership with the Gladstone Institute for Genetic Immunology directed by Alex Marson with UCSF and UCLA. So, you know, California institutions in our ecosystem to then advance these to clinical trials. And our key focus is on indication agnostic turnkey solutions. That's the central goal. And of course, stable engagement with the FDA, precisely like the antisense community has done. So our vision is to start with things we can do now, and the initial focus is disorders of the blood and disorders of the brain, but they're really scaling up the platform in a way where we really reduce the cogs and create academic nonprofit frameworks for getting this to patients. So I was really affected by the fact that Dr. Hobbs mentioned sequencing because, you know, we didn't coordinate. I closed on um, this slide 
So uh, also thanks to Eric Topol for tweeting it this morning. Eric is magnificent and an inspiration to us all. So you've all read the paper in the New England Journal about a 24-hour based turnaround from having a severely ill uh, uh, pediatric patient uh, to basically understanding what the genetic basis is. And fortunately, there was a small molecule intervention. But what about the other children for whom we don't have that? And now we read um, uh, in this marvelous uh, new work from uh, JAMA Pediatrics that uh, uh, introduction of whole genome sequencing is associated with a significant increase in focused clinical management. So what is it going to take to to have these rapid NGS diagnostics at hospitals, such as the ones where all of you work, to having a CRISPR treatment. Here are the takeaways. CRISPR-Cas has reduced to clinical practice the notion that in the age of CRISPR, everything in the human genome is a druggable target. There is a charted path to the clinic for ex vivo, the hemoglobinopathies, for example, HIV and cancer, and in vivo for TTR amyloidosis, hemophilia B, LSD1, LSD2, uh, Leber's congenital amyloidopathy, um, HIV, for in vivo deployment for monogenic or infectious disease. There, will, there is rapid progress of key additional technologies such as delivery that will expand the scope. The current framework is not scalable to N of one, period, end of paragraph. We need a fundamentally new approach that is currently being developed in academic medicine in nonprofit institutions where we look for synergies to develop a new one. And last point, we have a unique opportunity to leverage progress in genomic analysis to specifically address the M of one challenge. So what did I tell you today? You know, if we think about Leonardo's vision, this is the flying machine. And of course, here we are before the pandemic, ATC West Coast, this is what this actually happened. So what did it take? I mean, it took an enormous amount of innovation and leveraging technologies and new partnerships to make this real. We are convinced that the Innovative Genomics Institute that this is actionable in the nonprofit academic sector. This requires a translational mindset from the start set. This requires thinking end to end, so really building vertically integrated pipelines. And this requires novel teaming up, really individuals, institutions across that space coming together to forge new partnerships. So I'm really grateful uh, for the fact that we, uh, that the IGI got invited and honored, frankly, and eager for your perspective. I'm just gonna close with a quote from the United States Marine Corps. You know, this is hard and this is scary, totally. But here's what the USMC says. Uh, courage is not going into a room full of fear and afraid. It's being afraid and still going in. And I think we owe it all to the folks who are affected with gen genetic disease to exhibit mindful courage as we're walking towards this uncharted waters of building a nonprofit academic framework to take on the challenge of genetic disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ernest. That was a, just an incredible presentation. We thank you uh, very much for that. Um, and we have multiple questions that are in the queue now um, that we will ask you to address if you are, are willing. Um, the first question is, researchers tell me that AFH1L is too big a gene for AAV. When will the future and science advance for AAV to incorporate big genes like AFH1L? Oh my goodness, I'm going to temper my desire to give a 15 minute presentation. I did my PhD and postdoc in uh, uh, the field that AASH1L is. It's absent or small homeotic disks. It's a, it's a chromatin modifier. Um, so there are two components here. Um, it is in fact, along with many, many other genes that are in, implicated in genetic disease, too large to fit into an adeno-associated virus. Work by many is focused on expanding the packaging size of AAV to allow a classic gene therapy approach. The question of when the next five years is I think tractable. I do wanna emphasize that the promise of CRISPR and more recent CRISPR modalities such as base editing and prime editing de developed by David Liu's lab at the Broad is you can either do classical gene therapy, which is the addition of the entire thing by a virus, or you can attempt to repair the causative mutation in situ. So I really think that over the next five years, we will see parallel progress. It's not a zero sum game, everybody wins. Parallel progress in expanding the packaging limit of adeno associated virus to carry genes such as Ash1 and progress in CRISPR deployment in novel settings to repair the causative point mutation. Thank you for asking. I can't believe I just got asked about Ash1L. 
<laughs> That's great. Um, next question. What do you see as the future of research approaches with biallelic genes and conditions? Biallelic gene, what, I'm sorry? Oh, biallelic, biallelic genetic conditions. Yeah. So if I understand the question correctly, if the question is, you have an individual uh, where both copies of the gene are uh, not wild type. And so, you know, cystic, uh, sickle, right? Um, uh, I think, and you know, this child with a rare autoimmunity ha is a compound head. Uh, Carly Koch was a compound head. Um, I see that this in particular, especially for, especially for disorders of the blood, for disorders of the liver, have a very strong direct future because most of these conditions tend to be genetically recessive, most of them, not all. Um, and as a result, they are amenable to both gene therapy and for example, for disorders of the blood, this is lentivirus, which is large in packaging size. Uh, and uh, it's also amenable to CRISPR. You typically need to repair only one copy in order to gain some uh, clinical benefit. So I think that right now, in terms of the uh, quote, rare, it's not rare. 300 million people have a rare disease. Um, the progress here really needs to focus actually on those. And this is why, you know, the IGI is working on sickle, why we're working on rare immune deficiencies such as IL-2-RA deficiency or, or um, um, uh, congenital disorders of being able to form healthy, healthy immune system cells because that we believe is a prime opportunity to get either gene therapy or CRISPR to really showcase what it can do. Great, thank you. Is there any CRISPR clinical trial or plan for CRISPR uh, trial for primary immune deficiency? Um, we just talked about that. And um, uh, I guess her child or his child has a breakage uh, syndrome and, and then primary immune deficiency is part of it. Yeah, so uh, I, you asked this question at the right time. So, um, the, the, the first thing to do is connect with, I'm just gonna put, put their names out there because they're incredibly impactful. So uh, Mike Leonardo at the NIH directs one of the biggest clinical programs in the North, North America on precisely those conditions. On the West Coast, let me draw your attention to uh, Mort Cowan and Jennifer Puck at UCSF. So the first thing to do is get a clinician who treats these disorders with genome. There, I, I wanna be clear, there are others. There's St. Jude, there is, uh, oh, it's a cancer center, but they really would look at this. There's City of Hope, there's UCLA, there's Seattle Children's. But I think, you know, if you wanted to start, like the centers in America that could take a given genetic condition of this type and say, okay, here's the spectrum of clinical trials are, are those two centers. And yes, feel free to reach out to me, my Ernov at Berkeley. Um, I'm happy to uh, attempt to, do, to run some connection in this space. But of all the genetic disorders, primary disorders of the immune system that can be treated by repairing the blood system are the number one candidate for gene therapy or CRISPR. I'll just add a little color here, if I may. Uh, we have a patient who, uh, parents who've uh, given a video. And so if you were to go to Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, you'd see this story about this just wonderful 18-month-old um, now who when he was two or three weeks um, was diagnosed with severe combined immune deficiency and did go to Jennifer Puck after we had his oh. uh, disorder. And oh, uh, it's just a, a wonderful story from the parents. As well. Oh my goodness. Well, I'll download that as soon as I can because it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, the next question, what is the longest chain of DNA that current gene editing could try to tackle? And if the answer isn't known, could, would you suggest a good person to ask? Oh, the answer is no. Mm. Sorry, that sounds kind of terrible. But I just really want to emphasize, I, you asked it a perfectly good time because there are other to genomic approaches. Okay, so that right now, in a dish, if you want to edit human cells in a dish, it is realistic to insert anywhere between five and 10,000 base pairs. In vivo, so if you want to insert the liver, it's real, more realistic to do 3.5 to 4. So it, that works for many conditions, but not all. So as CRISPR and gene therapy scientists are working on expanding that limit, there are other technologies that, believe it or not, don't use plain vanilla CRISPR that are explicitly configured to insert larger things. 
And a really good example is the approach being developed by Tessera, T-E-S-S-E-R-A, and reach out to them. Uh, because I think the kinds of approaches they're building, it, believe it or not, it's, uh, some, of it, some of it has CRISPR flavor, but it's not. It's sort of next, next gen approaches to insert larger things. Um, and I think they would be a fantastic org to reach out to uh, with a use case scenario, because I think you know, the, the more all of these companies in genomic medicine space are interested in situations where they have a disease indication where their technology platform has a unique angle. Tessera, T-E-S-S-E-R-A. A question came in. While genomic medicine has continued to accelerate, the accessibility and equity around the future or access in genomic technologies remains a question. How do we ensure an equitable future for rare disease patients in the context of genomic medicine? So I'm going to say something very strong. As of September, 2021, I do not see an equitable health just path for N of one genetic disease in the settings of for-profit medicine as currently instantiated in the United States of America. There is no business model through which it is profitable for a publicly held biotech with a market cap of $10 billion and a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to remain viable. This means that we must instantiate a next generation, federal, state, nonprofit, private partnership to address the public health challenge of N of one disease. And I should really emphasize that multiple institutions across the nation the Innovative Genomics Institute, St. Jude, and so many others, and both federal programs and state programs. So I really want to flag the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine for their leadership, um, are really thinking and acting very hard about how to do this. We're not going to rewrite capitalism. That's not the plan. The plan is simply when Carly Koch is sitting there pondering her imminent death with her mom, and there is a center which can build a medicine that can repair that mutation. How do we do what Tim Yu has done, but scalably? The technologies are there to a large extent. We need to build the partnerships, the infrastructure, and then escalate that to the federal, state, and the nonprofit level to start really addressing the challenge. I know I have said a lot, and I know that's a very ambitious goal, but there is no other path to the best. I, I am certain there is no other path. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, what is the future of research approaches for conditions in which primary change causes intellectual disability and nonverbal disorders? So I've spent 23 years focused on RET, which is devastating. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's a tragedy. And uh, speaking from that perspective, I can tell you we are, we are leading an active effort in RET in partnership with the RET Syndrome Research Trust. And uh, using that use case scenario, um, I can tell you the following. The momentum is broadly speaking this. We have to do genomic therapy trials to affect some disease modifying change of some component of the circuitry. In other words, you know, if you take a human being with RET, and, you know, a woman who's 25, I don't think, even though the disease is reversible in the mouse, I don't think anybody's serious about the fact that we're going to restore that human being to the functionality of a 25 year old. But if we can repair some components of the suffering that this human has, you know, the seizures, the breath holding, the other issues, then we can push the timeline to the start of the clinical trial to earlier and earlier, ultimately with a vision of getting to a safety and efficacy record where the agency would let us dose neonates, frankly. You know, as soon as the genomic diagnosis is issued to allow us to dose as early as we can, Again, it's all about safety, right? First to no harm, we, you know, one severe adverse event, although they have occurred, right? But, you know, that's just, we have to be very mindful. And then I'm going to say something truly, truly ambitious. And I really want to honor Dr. Tippi McKenzie, who is the, um, a, 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 PDA, a fetal surgeon at UCSF and the director for the Institute for Regenerative Medicine, for her leadership on the vision that ultimately for those genetic conditions which are diagnosed in utero, we have to start to seriously discuss the ethics, the ethics, and the clinical deployment of in utero gene editing. So I know I just said a lot, but this is being seriously worked on 
in the genomic therapies community. So please watch this space. I think that's excellent and important because when we think about um, being able to diagnose disorders in the fetus, it only helps those when the baby is born and prepare um, for what is going to be needed right away rather than taking four or five days to determine that. So uh, I, I think that's really important. Uh, another question from one of our attendees. Do you know of any group working on single gene mutations in skin for rare, painful skin diseases? And then she adds, you are amazing, by the way. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So, so we're going to help you say, oh, my goodness, I, I, you're too kind. Uh, uh, I have an honor of working on this building you see behind me. And this is <laughs> the building is amazing. And Jennifer and the people working in it and my community. Of, um, so, yes. So uh, drop me a note. I will send you a set of, or not at Berkeley, adult edu. I will send you a list of folks who are thinking very hard about skin delivery and for example, things like EB. Um, I, you know, the, the really remarkable thing about skin is, you know, it's one of the most deliverable to organs in the human body because it's so essentially it's, it's on the surface of all of us. And I think frankly, in the next five years, uh, you know, addressing the, 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 the devastating skin, genetic skin condition such as EB is absolutely where to go it's striking to me that, you know, biotechs are not really working to the best of my knowledge actively on skin. So I think this is, you know, and I'll mention some academic groups in, 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 my, in my email exchange with you. Uh, it's I think this is a really great opportunity for academic medicine to step in to do sort of early stage clinical trials. So that's to really show the promise. Drop me a note, I'll send you some links. Right. Um, another one from one of our attendees, what is the progress with CRISPR on autosomal dominant conditions? Ooh. So um, we absolutely can. So, okay, I'm sorry. I do not mean to deprive everyone of their will to live by lecturing you on basic genetics. But in brief, things that are genetically dominant exist in two flavors. Believe it or not, the more common one are things that are haploinsufficient. Namely, they're genetically dominant because loss of one copy is not enough. And so it behaves dominantly, but in fact, it's a loss of function. So I think there the progress is actually really inspiring. And let me draw your attention to the work by ENCODED, which is basically working on a treatment for Dravet. And what they're doing is they're upregulating the remaining wild type copy. But the really sort of serious thing here is, you know, when you have a true gain of function allele. And I think here the promise is a very clear one. And, you know, a good example is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is what, um, for example, both Sangamo and um, it, has an, it has a dominant negative phenotype or TTR. So the first one is, of course, to basically take and get rid of the toxic allele. You can do that by standard knockout, but the complementary approach, which I'm very excited about, again, two uh, biotechs that are working on this, beam therapeutics and prime medicine. And they basically have platform technologies to repair point mutations. So they're sort of the elimination of the dominant negative allele by a precise reversal of the positive gene it is, is where this is going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Ernoff, thank you very much. And uh, um, as you can tell, there are very engaged audience and really um, very much appreciate your time with question and answers.